hello everyone. Um, welcome to our latest Libertas lecture, um, Financial Crime and Pregnancy in Prison. This webinar presents the research of our expert, Dr. Lucy Baldwin, on the shocking circumstances for pregnant women in UK prisons, particularly for non-violent offences, and particularly following the tragic case of Louise Powell, that most of you remember was the uh, prisoner who uh, had, uh, who gave birth to a stillborn baby in the toilet of a cell at Style Prison, um, and has been quoted as saying that she will never forgive the prison for the horror death. She didn't know she was pregnant. She begged for an ambulance before her baby died, and she was left alone crying uh, for help. And um, that tragic case really brought to our attention the work that Dr. Lucy Baldwin has been doing for a very long time and the situation that those of us working in the context of women and the criminal law are very well aware of, that the experiences of women who are pregnant um, and are suitable for alternative to custodial sentences and fit within all the international guidance on non-punishment of of children and child rights, as well as the approach to uh, non-discrimination against women are seriously affected by prison sentences and shockingly for prison sentences for financial crime at all levels of finance. Um, obviously, most of you know me, I'm Felicity Gerry, Queen's Council, a member of Libertas Chambers. I um, got involved in a four year project, I think dating back as long ago as 2013, 2014 on women in prison for LexisNexis and produced two reports for what was then Holsbury's Law Exchange that brought together all the research and practice uh, in relation to women in prison. And we know how high the levels of vulnerability are and those levels have really not diminished, probably got worse since Baroness Corston's report. So I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes after we've had our lecture from Lucy. She's a senior lecturer in criminal, criminology based at uh, the Community and Criminal Justice Division in the Health and Life Sciences Faculty at De Montfort University. It's quite a mouthful, Lucy. It is, it is. Uh, her research focuses on the impact of maternal imprisonment on mothers and children and their wider families. I'm hoping you can all see her slides and Lucy, Thank you so much for uh, get, giving up your time for our webinar today. Over to you for about 30 minutes. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much for that introduction, Felicity. It's um, my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I might turn sideways because my screen is, is on this side. So I'm not being rude if I'm not looking at you. I'm reading my screen this side. So Got it. Um, Thank yeah. you. <laughs> so hello everybody. Um, I thought I would try today and give you a bit of a flavour about what it might feel like to be pregnant in prison as well as some of the context around pregnancy in prison. Um, but first, like, um, like Felicity said, now I just need to figure out which way um, the slat, how do I upright it? So, um, who am I? Yep, yeah, I'm a senior lecturer. I've been a senior lecturer for nearly 20 years now, um, 35 years altogether, practice in criminal and social justice. It makes me feel very old to say that. Um, previous experience as a social worker and a probation officer, working in prisons and in the community with men and women, actually. But my research has always focused on mothers and motherhood and maternal identity and maternal emotions. And I don't know if that's just because I've been a mother forever. <laughs> I had my um, first child when I was 16 after a, um, a very I get, um, a difficult start in life, I guess. I share a lot of the characteristics with a lot of the women who I work with. And so I think their stories and their experiences and their lived experience in terms of trauma and shame and judgment um, I can really relate to. Those of you who were alive in the 80s can remember that single parent mothers were vilified by the wonderful Thatcher. <laughs> so, yes, so that's me. Um, I'm trying to make sure, right, this is it. So, so normally my research, I, like Felicity said, I look more broadly at motherhood and I look at the 
the impact on from a from a doctoral research, for example, was around motherhood more generally and the impact of maternal imprisonment on maternal identity and role and how it severs and breaks those relationships with children. And also one thing that really came strongly through my research was that we're really missing and losing opportunities to harness motherhood in terms of a protective factor. Um, if, if motherhood isn't acknowledged for women in the criminal justice system, either if it's ignored or it's damaged, then we, we, we're losing women. If women lose children to local authority or to care, um, or, or even to relatives who don't want to give them back while women are in prison, then that can have a massive impact on the rest of their lives and their children's lives. And I think we don't recognise maternal trauma enough and how that intersects with engagement with professionals in the criminal justice system, with rehabilitation and with persistence. And obviously, women with children are sometimes quite reluctant to engage with authorities because, the, because of the ultimate fear of losing their child. So there's a lot to do in terms of working more positively with women. And my research looks at that in that more broader context. But today we will be focusing specifically on on criminalised pregnant women. Um, so what do we already know about women in prison? And that obviously includes pregnant women. We know that 66% of the female population are mothers. That actually is a real underestimation. What that's the last um, figure that was collected, that's a very old study, that was 1997. We have no further updated study that gives us a really accurate picture of the numbers of mothers in prison, which is crazy when you think about it. But my best estimate, and a lot of people who kind of work with me who work with women would say it's much higher than that, probably uh, probably as high as, if not higher than 80%. Um, we know that more children are affected by parental imprisonment every year in the UK than, than by divorce. We know that around about 17 to 18,000 children and 12 to 13,000 women are separated annually, despite the fact that women make up only 5% of the pop prison population because they tend to go in for very short sentence, that turnover is quite high. We know that there's a difference when a father goes to prison than when a, a mother goes to prison, and fundamentally the biggest dis dis difference is that when a father goes to prison, 95% of children are cared for at home by the mother. But when a mother goes to prison, only 5% of children remain in their own home, which is phenomenal when you think about it. 95% of those children affected are displaced to other homes in the care of various different relatives or, or local authority care. 14% go directly into local authority care. We know, and these are, the, these are figures that are disclosed, remember, so I'm sure all of you can recognise that often disclosed and recorded statistics are, are often the tip of the iceberg. So around about 50% of women are recorded as experiencing abuse as a child or an adult or both. We know that there's a high rate of self-harm in the prison population. Women actually account for a quarter of all self-harm incidents in, in the whole of the prison estate, despite only making up 5% of the prison population. And I think the figure that almost half of the population in prison of, of female offenders have previously attempted suicide. That figure alone I think really highlights just how vulnerable the population, the female prison population can be. Almost half of them have not wanted to be alive. So that is quite significant. We know that more than 70% of women remanded will not go on to receive a custodial sentence. I don't know why I put four instead of two, but you'll get the gist. Um, the statistics for 2019 show that 62% of women had prison sentences of less than six months. Sometimes it's a matter of weeks, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, it's ridiculous periods of time women in the UK or women in England uh, and Wales are sent to prison for. So you've got all of that before you even think about the fact that you're separating mothers from children or, or that you're entering a prison space as a pregnant woman. So there's, there's, there's layers and layers and layers of vulnerability and trauma that come with a woman when she comes to prison. And we know that for most women, it's the first time, the first period of any length that, that they've been separated from their children. We know because of the geographical displacement of, of female prisons, that women on average are between 60 and 150, but sometimes as far as 200 miles away from family. 
and we know that many women do not expect a custodial sentence mainly because of the lack of the seriousness of most of the offences. But I have to say, sometimes because they've been actively told by legal representation not to expect it, it's not likely, don't worry, you won't go to prison. And that might come as a shock to you, as it did to me. You'd think that that wouldn't be something that was said, but I've had far too many women say that to me, and, and colleagues have had the same for, for it not to be the case. And so for some women, it's a complete surprise when they go well not a complete surprise but you know when it's unexpected unexpected event so they might have dropped their children to school that morning expecting to pick them up and not mentioned anything to the child and then they get sent to prison absolutely in shock not having memorized any numbers not having taken anything and not prepared the children and that's something that happens far too often we know that many women are in prison for breach and recall particularly in the post transform and rehabilitation era recalls to prison have gone up exponentially and that can be immediate executed on a warrant that doesn't actually involve the court but women can be brought back very very quickly i've heard only this week actually that a woman who i can only assume it is a, a warrant situation has been sent to prison a day after giving birth i don't need to tell you i'm sure that that means her baby won't be with her and the consequences of that for her and her baby are potentially lifelong. And that's a significant part of, of women's in prison's experience. We don't actually know how many women are in pregnant at any in prison are pregnant at any given time or how many births occur. The, av the average, there's, there's various different statistics, and it's kind of the, the latest best guess was around about 100 babies a year are born from mothers in prison. Um, and the Nuffield um, research Centre has estimated that one in ten of those will be babies born inside the prison, will be born in a cell. That's disputed, but it's a figure that enough aid health care, you know, came up with. We know that many women don't actually find out that they're pregnant until reception. All women are offered a pregnancy test on reception, but they don't have to take it, and that isn't repeated. It isn't necessarily a, a, a repeated offer. And Felicity mentioned, mentioned Louise Powell at the beginning. Louise was obviously offered a pregnancy test on her reception into custody, but she had never, to her knowledge, had any relationships with men, so she didn't believe it possible that she could be pregnant, hence her refusal for the test, um, and hence her not knowing she was pregnant. And she, she remained very tiny throughout her pregnancy. So... We know that women's, women in prison have very complex, multiple layers of needs, and we know that realistically there's a shared responsibility amongst police, CPS, the legal profession, healthcare, social services, society, everybody really has a responsibility to try and address women's complex needs earlier, to try and make sure women don't end up being criminalised for poverty and trauma, which is currently the situation. So multiple studies have identified that prison compromises pregnant women's safety, well-being and health in prison, obviously consequently has an impact on the child, but potentially is lifelong. We know the system isn't really designed for pregnant women. There's a lot of institutional thoughtlessness about pregnancy in prison. Um, pregnant women tend to feel very ashamed to say, Motherhood is, is, is one of the most judged identities, I think, in the world, the world over consistently. And when you're a pregnant mum, you're kind of never more obviously a mum than when you're pregnant. And there's something mentally challenging, I think, for, for a lot of people to think about a pregnant woman in a prison space. And women will talk about how they feel like it's a badge of shame having a pregnant tummy in a prison environment. It's incongruous to, have to be pregnant in a prison. And I think women feel that very deeply. In prison, women do not always receive what they're entitled to. They're supposed to have additional food. They're supposed to have pregnancy packs. They're supposed to have breast pads in a particular mattress. The mattresses are about this thick um, and in many prisons. And those things don't always happen. And we know that that's something that's not consistent throughout the female estate. It goes without saying that there is a risk. There is, prisons can be volatile spaces. Um, and at, when you're carrying precious cargo, 
that can feel terrifying. Women talk about walking around with their arms protectively over their tummies all of the time. And you see that a lot with pregnant women in prison, you know, they'll be walking around with their hands across their bellies just in case anything happens. And the stress of that worry of, is your baby getting enough food? Is your baby being affected by your stress? Is your baby growing because you don't have exactly the same access to a midwife or friends where you can just say, oh, I don't think I felt a pig today or, or I'm worried about this or do you think this is normal? Women, pregnant women in prison don't have that access all of the time, although it's changing, but I'll come back to that. Um, so it's not, it's, not a hundred, it's not a safe space for pregnant women. There's no two ways about it. Prison is not a safe space for pregnant women. So why are pregnant women sent to prison? Like Felicity said at the beginning, most often for non-violent offences, very often for offences related to financial gain or fraud. Um, Epstein did a, an et al. did a study just published very recently with 22 women, and they had five pregnant women for shoplifting, five for breach recall, uh, which meant failure to attend appointments, which for one woman was because she... Um, didn't didn't attend her appointments because she was living in a car park. Her life was in chaos. Um, who were on remand and four for drugs offences. In earlier research of mine and and Epstein, Epstein's, we had a woman who was in prison. Pregnant women who were in the stolen goods, divert and electricity, and benefit fraud. So again, very often, like I said, women are being criminalised for traumatic experiences, for being in part of coercive and controlling relationships that drag them into offending or, or as a result of poverty. Very few women are in prison because of violent offences and that applies to pregnant women too. We know that a fifth of all female prisoners are on remand and in 2019, 35% of women were in prison for a first offence, which I think is just shocking. 34% of convictions were for shoplifting. The most common summary offence was TV license evasion. 74% of all convictions, summary convictions in 2019. And that was identified by Crest in 21. I mean, it blows my mind that we send women to, pri to prison for TV license evasion or for death or for the child's truancy. You know, if you, imagine that if you have a, a pregnant mom or, or a mom who is a single parent mother and a child is truanting from school, normally when children truant, there's multiple reasons that are impactful within the family and psychological, emotional, loads of reasons. Children don't tend to do it just for the fun of it. I know I did it. Um, and you then take that single parent mum out of that family and you put her in prison. How is that going to help? Like, where's the logic? How is that going to help? That's what happens. That's what happens. What does it feel like to be pregnant in prison? These are some of the things that women have spoke to me about in my research, and it's just heartbreaking. What if it kicks off? What if I get caught up in it? What if I get kicked? Mandy worried about what if her partner left her because she was in prison and she was kind of absent, but would worry about those relationships, the baby's father leaving them. Rita worried about coping. She just thought it would be just too hard to cope in prison as a pregnant woman. She didn't think she could deal with it. What if I don't get a space on an MBU? There are only six mother and baby units in, in, in the UK and they're geographically quite dispersed and the application process is onerous. There are lots of different people who make up part of an assessment for an MBU space. And Mia Sikand, who's another um, a barrister, a phenomenal woman like Felicity, who did a brilliant report called Lost Spaces on um, the application process, for MBUs and she looked at some of the terrible things that kind of occur around that process. The application process is long, it happens very late in the pregnancy, sometimes not even till after the baby's born, which means women worry all the way through their pregnancies about whether they're going to be able to keep their child in prison with them. Um, I mean just think how stressful that is. Women talk to me about how they didn't bond with their babies when the babies were inside them deliberately. They tried not to think about them. They tried to disassociate from their pregnancy just in case their child was going to have to go outside. And I mean, that is just horrific. Fazar talked about, will an officer be at my birth? Will it be a man? There's every chance it would be. Lots of women have talked about how officers have been present at birth, not even always at the top end. There are women who have spoke to me about being absolutely mortified that officers have been 
present at their birth male officers and down the business end. Will I be in handcuffs? Will I be taken to hospital in handcuffs? The reality is yes, probably. Until very recently, that was a regular occurrence. I was speaking to a woman just this week who's been, who was taken to hospital in handcuffs in labour and they weren't taken off until she was quite far into her labour. She never committed a violent offence in her life. Um, her offence has nothing to do with violence and she was handcuffed in her labour. Um, this is not what I wanted. I've already failed, says Kezia. She's, she feels already that her she can't give her child anything because she's in prison. And Kezia almost, she didn't, but Kezia almost gave her child up for adoption because she felt such a failure. Um, and I'm happy to tell you she didn't. And they have a wonderful bond now. She very nearly did. Who will be with me? Meg was terrified about giving birth without a partner, without a mum, and it just being officers and how she coped with that because she was very, very young and she wanted her mum there. Will I get an MBU space? Um, and Claire wanted a mum and the worry, the constant worry that all mums talk about because mums read the news too. Mums know about them. You know, the, the mum who, whose baby died in Bronfield and the baby who died in style and the baby who died on the way to hospital from Bronfield. Mums know about these too. So the constant worry for the mothers is, will I give birth in myself? Will I be ignored? Will I give birth on my own? What if my baby dies? And they're very, very real concerns for mums. And it doesn't, even if mums get a, a space on the MPU, which is the ideal in a terrible situation, because obviously it's better for mums and babies to stay together. But even in that situation, life is still difficult. It's no picnic living on an MBU. However wonderful an MBU is, and some of the mother and baby units have absolutely fantastic, dedicated, qualified staff. That doesn't alter the fact that the MBU shouldn't exist. It shouldn't be part of a prison at all. And pregnant women shouldn't be sent to prison, in my view, unless it's a really serious violent offence. So, the, so there is some good work goes on in the MBU, but there's still difficult experiences for mums. Um, lots of mums used to talk to me about how there was the, very much the feeling of, you should be grateful you're on here. We can take your baby at any time. If you don't behave, your baby will be sent out. And the reality is I know women that is happy to. You know, their babies have been taken off them and sent outside the family or local authority because of behavioural issues of the mums. And that's that's fundamentally not right. Um, mums are frightened to ask for help because they know they're being watched. They know they're constantly being assessed. They know information will be fed to social services. So if mums are struggling... They really don't, they're frightened to ask for help because of how it might look. Because ultimately, the ultimate fear is losing their child. And the thing is, when you're a mum and an MBU, outside, you can all say to, you know, a partner, a friend, a mum, an auntie, a, a godmother, whatever, oh, can you take the pen for a little while? Just so I can pop the shops, just so I can do the signing, just so I can go and deliver a lecture, just so I can go and defend somebody terrible in court whatever mums have a break outside even work a break but you know what I mean mums are not always mums 24 7 in an active role on an MBU you are you don't get that break that in itself mums talk about how exhausting that is how really exhausting that is and there are some babies who get taken out by relatives but fundamentally most of the time you are responsible for that child all the time Rita had to make a decision um, because her children, she had, she was, she had a baby who was eligible to come into prison with her. Um, but she, the MBU would have taken her over 150 miles away from her other children. So she had to make a decision: Do I take my baby? Do I bring my baby in prison with me and go and live in this MBU? That will mean my other children can't visit me. Or do I leave my baby outside so it's with all of my children and all of my children can visit? What kind of choice is that? Like, it's it's like the film Sophie's Choice. That's what she described it as. After she felt like she was choosing between her children, and in the end, she made the horrible, difficult decision to leave her baby outside with its siblings so she could see them all together. But her baby was young when she came to prison, months old, and it changed the course of their lives. But oh. 
I might not have time to tell you the rest of that story, but anyway, and, and yet, so Leah talked, Leah talked about the same kind of thing. In, in an MVU meant she was miles away from everybody else. Um, up until very recently, mothers on an MBU didn't get paternity leave. So at six weeks, they were you back to work, you back to education, you back to whatever you were doing in the prison before you had the baby. And Katie talked about how she would never have left her child that young in the community, ever, ever. And she hated being forced to go back to work. She 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 thought it was terrible. She could hear her baby screaming from where she was in the prison. And when she used to get Aggie, they couldn't they they couldn't understand it. And she could kind of see the MBU window from where she was. So she kept going to the window to try and see the baby. And what they did was they blocked the window, they covered the window. Belle talked about how she just had no idea what she was doing. She really struggled again, but didn't want to ask, to help, ask, ask for help. And Father taught, identified something that, again, is changing. But there are staff on MBUs who don't believe women should have babies in MBUs. Crazy. And women, women hear that. Women recognise that. Women understand that people are judging them every minute of every day by just their actions, their their persona, the tone of their voice, and women recognise that. And Father says, the ones that don't want to be here hate us. They think we don't deserve our babies with us. And imagine what that does to you, knowing that somebody who's looking at you all day, every day with that feeling, and you recognise that, you're picking up on that. And women also talked about the shame they felt and the guilt they felt about the fact that their babies could see bars and keys, that their babies were fundamentally in prison. However pretty it looked, however child-friendly it looked, however pretty the nursery was, there were people there with keys and there were bars the children saw. And mothers talk about how earth-shatteringly guilty that made them feel. But they recognised that that was better than the children being outside. So some of the things that mums have said, Beth, who we're going to talk about later, who was sent to prison for a financial crime, I was locked in this horrible, lonely, scary place with leaking breasts and no baby. I held my pillow like it was my child and it was soaked with my milk and my tears. I felt bereft. I've never felt grief or pain like it. Tina talked about the shame. She made her room nice and homely. She made it, you can make a tiny, tiny space nice with a cot in and photographs and everything. She made it beautiful. But then there was a search on the MBU and she describes how everything was flung about. Everything was just thrown. And she said she felt violated for her and for her baby. And she said it's never not a prison. TJ talks about how when she took her child out in the push there, after I was out, he would just scream and scream when I was walking down the road after she was out being in release. I didn't get it. I couldn't work it out. Then I realised he was scared. He was scared of the traffic. He'd never seen traffic. We'd only walked around outside the prison and it was quiet there. He was scared of the traffic, of the cars. I don't think I've ever felt so shit. He was scared of normal life. How bad is that? TJ was broken at re that realization and katie whose little girl is 10 now still doesn't know that her daughter still doesn't know that she spent the first five months of her life in a prison in BU because katie is so deeply ashamed she doesn't want to tell her and katie talks about how when she does tell her she expects her daughter to reject her and hate her and said to me i deserve that i deserve that the shame is so deep it's lifelong that it is a life sentence emotionally for the mothers who are sent to prison and then covid hit mothers in mbus had babies that have never met another person than mbu staff babies went 18 months without even meeting their fathers their grandmothers their siblings they didn't meet them only now are they meeting them i was with a mum recently whose baby met its dad and the baby screamed constantly imagine that Felicity talked a little bit about Louise Powell, who didn't know she was pregnant and absolutely had the devastating experience of giving birth to her daughter in a prison cell toilet breach. Absolutely terrified, for, terrifying for her, devastating for her and her family and for her cellmate who was with her the whole time and who was asking for help with her. 
and didn't get it. And the pathologist can't say for certain that the baby girl, Brooke, would have lived had she been born in hospital, but she certainly would have had a good chance. And Louise absolutely 100% believes if her baby, if she'd been sent to prison in labour as opposed to being kept in the prison, sent to hospital, sorry, in labour, as opposed to being kept in prison, she absolutely 100% believes her daughter would be alive. And she would, as she says to me, I'd be a mum now. She's doing good, but she's broken at the same time. She shouldn't have had to go through that. Miss A, who's a woman who lost her baby in Bronzefield, in 2019 was an 18-year-old girl woman who was on remand and she was remanded at 32 weeks pregnant. She made a call. She was regarded as difficult by the prison. So her, I don't know if that's a connection, but anyway, she, put, she pressed her call bell. Nothing happened. There was no response. She didn't call again. And in the morning, she was found in bed with her dead baby she delivered on her own in a cell overnight. We're in 2022. I can't believe I'm talking to you about babies being born dead in prisons. In 2017, there was a baby born dead in an ambulance on the way to hospital. I'll say again what I said at the beginning, prisons are not a safe space for pregnant women. I've told, I've told you about those. So the questions we have to ask, are we going to time? Most female convicted offenders are sentenced to prison for non-violent Just keep crime. going, Lucy. We'll I finish your slides. Time. Just keep okay. going. Don't worry about time. All right. Thank you, lovely. Most female convicted offenders are sentenced to prison for non-violent crimes, which most often have no bearing on their ability to mother or love their child. That's really important. Yet some mothers, pregnant or otherwise, will lose their children, permanently lose their children, simply because of their custodial sentence. How can that, genuinely, how can that be fair? How can that be proportionate? And how can that be allowed to continue? But even separating mothers temporarily from children can cause lifelong harm. And that's important to recognise. That's important to recognise in sentencing decisions. It's important to recognise in the care of mothers and the responses to mothers and children affected by the criminal justice system. And importantly, babies in prison, from a children's rights perspective, babies have a right to a, a good start in life the best start in life and there are lots of circumstances why some babies don't have that but should we be responsible for sanctioning that for state sanctioning a start in life that's not good that, that, that harms the mums that harms the babies babies are affected by parental by maternal stress we know that it's a scientific fact and yet we, we're consistently putting women in, in prison who are pregnant or who are new mums and who are leaving babies outside. I was talking to one mum a few weeks ago who um, uh, had a baby literally wrenched from her arms um, to execute a warrant um, for, for breach of appointments. And the baby was literally wrenched from her arms screaming. The baby had never had anything other than breast milk and she was taken to hospital, uh, to prison. Even if she gets that baby into prison, it would be a period of weeks for a mother and baby board to sit for assessments to take place. So there's no way that, even if she gets that place, there's time for a separation. And one of the things that is, I think is really significant, and, and I think it will shock some people, is that, a lot, I mean, up until the Archers, uh, Helen in the, in the Archers got pregnant and there was an MBU space there was a whole discussion in the arches. Most people in the most of the general public didn't know MPUs exist. People don't know that mother and baby units exist, and that's the same for women in the criminal justice system. So many women have said to me recently, "I didn't know they existed." One woman told me just a couple of weeks ago, she very very nearly terminated her pregnancy because she didn't know that MPUs existed. It was just fortuitous that somebody mentioned it. Another woman we talked about who, who was in a police station, she was convicted for death by um, careless driving and she was pregnant in the police station after arrest. 
she sat there absolutely terrified, thinking she was going to have to give her child to her mum, process or not, but she just didn't know they existed. And that in itself is incredibly traumatic for mothers to think that I'm going to be separated from my child. Um, I'm just aware I've gone on. Um, we know, I've said that really, we know that there's lots of harm. Now, I'm not saying that there haven't been some positive changes since the Miss A baby's death and Louise's baby's death and... Even before that, there was an investigation underway, a review of the operational policy was underway, and there have certainly been some positive changes. The, the MOJ has done a review of operational policy, HMP Law Newton, after the tragic death of a mother called Michelle Barnes, who killed herself um, just a few days after being permanently separated from her child and then being returned to prison and put in a cell by herself just after being separated from her child. You know, I talked about institutional thoughtlessness, but Law Newton have, to be fair to them, they've learned lessons. They now have um, a model of excellence, if you like, in terms of their perinatal pathway. Perinatal just means pregnancy and the 12 month period post pregnancy. They now have um, a very clear model of excellence that is um, being replicated through the female estate. And that's brilliant. They've got a, a, a resident midwife, the women have 24 access to midwife. Some pregnant women in prison now have their own mobile phone with um, midwife numbers pre-programmed. Sodexo have um, an excellent perinatal pathway and other prisons are, are doing the same. I work with Sodexo very closely on a motherhood project to look at um, how to implement positive changes for mothers and all mothers, not just mothers on the MBU. And some of those things that we don't have time to talk about today, and I know I'm talking really fast, I'm sorry, but some of those things are fantastic. Birth companions are a leading light in terms of um, advice and guidance around pregnancy and prison and mothers in prison. And they are, they've really, if you like, come to the fore in terms of advising policy and practice. Although they, they too absolutely say that prison is not a, a safe place for pregnant women, but are really committed to improving services while it still happens. We know that there's improvements with re services and care, and we know that there is. Um, now a newly developed um, support network for prison midwives to share good practice, to support each other. Um, and that is a network that's been created by Dr. Laura Abbott, who's done some fantastic work around pregnancy in prison and who um, her and I are writing a book together that will be published next year. Um, and she's amazing. And her network for the midwives is amazing. And look up some of her work if you have time to read it because she's just phenomenal. But absolutely, the only way to truly avoid some of the tragedies and disasters and trauma and stress that I've been talking about is to not send pregnant women to prison in all but the more serious circumstances. I know I've told you all the bad things. There are some positive, there is some good practice in prisons and mothers talk about that. They appreciate the kindness. They're grateful for the kindness. They're grateful for some of the... Um, positives that come when officers treat them well and when officers um, are, are, are kind and compassionate. I'm going to hush my mouth. There are some good practices. There are some good officers. There's no doubt about that. And there is a genuine real commitment to try to make things better. It doesn't alter the fact that it's still prison. It still shouldn't happen. But there are very definitely some good practices going on. And we do know that for some women who do get a space on the MBU, they may well have lost that child in the community. But social workers have, have, for, have given them a chance to have the baby in a safe, secure, contained space and enabled them to stay together. So there are some women who, after several local authority removals, do sometimes get a chance to keep their baby. Still doesn't have to be prison. There are alternative models in the community, but there are there is some good work going on in MBUs. There's been at least two cell births or prison births, not necessarily cell births, prison, prison births where mums have had babies in prison healthcare and because there's not been enough time to get them to hospital or because hospitals have sent them back, they've been very positive. They've both had positive outcomes. Um, Sodexo, certainly, Peterborough have recently had women give birth on Rottle, which is released on temporary licence, which means at that point the woman is, is basically turns up at hospital like a free woman. No handcuffs, no escorts, no nothing, which is absolutely fantastic. So nobody in the hospital would even need to know that she was a prisoner. Um, 
we know that there's some work going on to make sure that MBU boards happen earlier and that there's a rapid delivery of decisions. We know that there's a commitment to improve the application progress and we know that some hospitals have been challenged about practices. Sometimes, you know what it's like when a pregnant woman goes into a hospital, particularly if it's a first baby, even if the water's broke, sometimes the hospital says, it's going to be hours, go home, go and have a bath, come back. It's not like that if you're in prison because it takes at least an hour to get out of the prison, the paperwork to be done, the officers to be found, the escorts to be sorted, the vans to be sorted, to get through the building, to get through the gates. So there needs to be some communication with the hospitals about not sending women back, because some births have occurred in prison because hospitals have sent women back, just thinking it's easy for them to pop back to the hospital. It's not that easy when you're in prison. So there's lots of good work going on, but it's still prison. So how, sorry, I'm going to flip through these. I think that this, Felicity can probably circulate the slides. So what do we need to do? What can it change? I mean, I think personally, there needs to be, um, we have to address the sentencing framework, there has to be some accountability. I think when a pregnant woman is sent to prison, has genuinely every other option been explored? Is it genuinely a last resort? Can we absolutely say that definitively? Um, we need to follow the guidance, the, the EU guidance and the Bangkok rules. So that there, there is a, there, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming some of most of you are legal people, so you'll know about the Bangkok rules and the balancing exercise and all of the guidance that already exists. Sentences to refer to in relation to pregnant women, but you also know that not always is that guidance heeded. Um, in fact, there's research that tells us that, you know, quite often it's not. We know. I mean, I think we need a presumption against sentences less than 12 months, which would then take out a lot of the less serious crimes that women commit, means women will go, women won't go to prison at all. That in itself would half the prison population for females overnight. We need a presumption against pregnant mothers, pregnant mothers being sent to prison. We need to make sure that women are advised at the earliest opportunity about the possibility of an MBU and about the possibility if they have a child in the community under 18 months, they can apply to have that child taken to come in with them. And they need to know that and they need to be advised about that at the earliest opportunity. Um, fundamentally, I don't think mother and baby units should be in prisons. Um, there's enough expertise out there with Trevi House and Birth Companions to tell us what a good mother and baby unit and alternative to custody units should look like, and um, that should happen. Let me just have a finish that one. Yeah, and recognise the additional life. Just want to tell you a little bit about Beth. Beth was sent to prison when her baby was only three months old. Beth was sent to prison for shoplifting. Beth's the mum we talked about earlier on. Um, Beth, when I interviewed her at first, some of you might have heard me talk about Beth. When I interviewed Beth at first, she was traumatised because social workers had refused to take her baby to prison to, to visit her, common occurrence. So she hadn't seen her baby when she came out. So we, and because she had no family, because her family was abusive, her background was mirrors almost all of the things we said earlier. So her baby had gone into foster care. So social services wouldn't just give her a baby back and said she had to have supervised contact. Beth described how that supervised contact made her feel dreadful. She said, and, and because her baby had, had been so young, her baby didn't know her. And Beth felt the baby didn't know her, didn't recognise her, turned away from her and favoured the foster carers, which absolutely broke Beth. And she said that she previously felt it was the only thing she, she'd been good at. When she had her baby, she felt like, and I can relate to this. I remember when I had my baby at 16, I thought, I'm going to get this right. My life's going to change from this moment forward. I've got someone who loves me and who I love. And that's how Beth felt. For her, it was a change. It was a start. Sadly, shoplifting got her to prison. Um, and she described in an interview that she felt that the only way she could cope was to block out her emotions and to take drugs or drink. Um, because that's how she'd previously coped with that trauma of her past. And she couldn't see herself not doing that because she felt like such a failure. And that's what she said. She felt guilty every time she looked at her. She doesn't want me. She cries as soon as I hold her. And all that does is remind me of how crap I am at everything, but especially at being, on, at being a mum. On drugs, I can forget it all. When I'm off my face, it's the only time I can like myself, even a little bit. But sometimes I don't want to be here. What's the point of me now? I'm not even someone's mum. A year after that interview, Beth took her life. 
her daughter grows up without a mum and a young mum with masses of potential is dead, is that a proportionate or appropriate punishment for a financial crime? I think we know it's not. Please don't try and read all this now because some of that is just the guidance from the bank rules. I just thought I should include it. But I think, and this is what I'm not a legal mind, so some of this may be a wish list, but I think the courts need a perinatal pathway. The prisons and probation are looking at perinatal pathways. They're looking at how we respond differently to pregnant women and women with children. And I think we need one for the courts. And I think all of those things, all of those suggestions that I've put down there need to, need to be addressed if we develop that pathway. And I would absolutely love um, myself and Laura Abbott actually to be, to be working with the legal profession to kind of look at how we can try and make sure that some of the women who currently go to prison, pregnant or with young babies in the community, just do not end up in that space. We have to do something because what we're doing now is not enough. We have to do better because what we do now in, in some cases is absolutely it's lifelong. It's creating lifelong harm, and that's not proportionate for financial for financial crimes or crimes related to poverty. Thank you for listening, and that's the last word, to Ursula. And I'm sorry I went over time. Sorry, Felicity. Well, thank you, Lucy. Um, I feel really emotional about about what we've just heard heard from you. So it's very difficult to speak and follow that amazing presentation. Um, what I normally do in these lectures is follow up with about 50, 10 or 15 minutes of, of practice information for those of us who are lawyers as to what we are meant to do in relation to these situations. And we're focusing in this uh, webinar on financial crime. So the first thing I, I want to say in terms of practice is if you are representing a mother or a pregnant woman uh, particularly on sentence, but throughout the proceedings. Um, in my view, judges should watch, uh, lawyers should watch, um, everybody involved in the system should watch that webinar that Lucy has just produced. Uh, particularly on sentence, if you're coming up in front of a judge who thinks that the case of Petherick is the answer and if it's on the cusp, I might not send her to prison without defining what on, on the cusp means or engaging in the sort of research that we've heard today, then watch that webinar that Lucy has just produced. The research is there uh, for us to understand that it is totally wrong, in my view, to send a pregnant person to prison. The sorts of stories and the punishment that we've heard is totally brutal and shocking. A few things that I want to add. Um, I gave a lecture to some judges about women in prison some years ago, and um, none of them had read the Bangkok rules. So if you are going to court, have the Bangkok rules with you. Uh, have the international guidance with you. Talk about child rights as well as uh, the rights of women not to be discriminated against and disproportionately sentenced for minor financial crime. Um, take the research with you. Uh, we heard about Rona Epstein's recent research. Um, I unfortunately came up in front of a court of appeal judge who once said that if I was going to rely on the research, it had to be served as fresh evidence, even when it was published in a legal journal, which I thought was incorrect. But so what? Serve it as fresh evidence, if that's what the judges want. Serve it as part of your case. Um, in trying to persuade the prosecution to discontinue, give the CPS the research. You've got no um, guarantee that anybody has read all the research that is out there. I think it is quite rare. The terrible thing about our profession is that people don't read the research. There seems to be this separation between academia and practice that we really need to end, and which is why we design these webinars in the way that we do. So there are several stages. There's trying to persuade the CPS not to prosecute your, your client at all. If your client knows they're pregnant or if your client is a mother, this is the sort of information that you can place before the CPS in arguing that it's not in the public interest to prosecute your, your client at all for a financial offence. Then there's the, uh, let's assume a trial process. If the 
um, allegation is disputed. Now, one of the issues with these types of low level financial crime that we've heard of uh, uh, thus far is that they're often not disputed. It's admitted that there was shoplifting. We then need to make sure that the court understands why the shoplifting occurred um, if the case is admitted and it's proceeding to sentence. And then all of that research and knowledge is needed before the sentencing court. Um, if the case is disputed and there are to be trial issues, then um, even then some of that uh, information needs to be known by the court as best you can in relation to a person's character. We do have a lot of issues around gender and character and criticism of women, but it's important to be as knowledgeable as you can throughout the process and particularly at uh, sentence. Now, I've recently done a couple of sentencing appeals for high value financial crime. And both women had deceived their employers in relation to a, a, a very high financial, high financial crime. Both women had paid back about half, an enormous amount of money, uh, despite the fact that they couldn't work in the same profession. You've got to remember that these women are already being punished by being convicted. They have criminal convictions, so it's going to affect their ability uh, to work in the future uh, in a range of ways. So there is already a punishment. Um, now, these women, both of them had repaid I think about half, they were completely separate, uh, not related to each other at all, just two cases that I was privileged to be briefed in. And I argued that these were indeed exceptional circumstances. The women either had small children who were going into prison, so we're sentencing a child for an offence that they haven't committed, or they, they were pregnant. And one of those women had to, as Lucy has described, had to leave one child outside and give birth in prison. And um, in both of those cases, the court held that it there wasn't sufficient exceptional circumstances to overturn those sentences on appeal. And indeed, one of the main reasons that were given was that these issues hadn't been raised in the court below. It's a very old fashioned approach to um, the process of sentencing an individual, uh, which of course means that it's really important that we wait, raise these issues in the court below. And I don't think the Court of Appeal guidance in the case of Petherick is at all helpful. Um, it, if the judges are not seeing the research or understanding the sorts of situations that women are in, then they can't possibly form an opinion as to whether a sentence is on the cusp as the case of Petherick suggests. And we recently had some work by women in prison as an organization and a number of stakeholders trying to um, create new provisions to form part of the police courts uh, sentencing and crime act. We all know that the, uh, the new sentencing act sets out the provisions for sentencing. But there, was a, there were proposals to improve the Sentencing Act in relation to offenders who are primary carers, particularly women, uh, whether they are unborn or dependent children. And very basic provisions were suggested that, for example, when a court is sentencing a pregnant person or a primary carer for an unborn or dependent child, does it actually state ever have you ever heard a court say how the best interests of the unborn or dependent child were considered? Uh, is that a reasons ever given? I speculate no, I don't think we've got an analysis of judgments, but if you're appearing, ask the judge to do so. And the proposal suggested a minimum that the court should express factors like the child's views, now that might be a sibling to a pregnant mother, the child's identity, preservation of the family envi environment and maintaining relations, care protections and safety of the child. What's the situation of vulnerability? I wasn't sure if I was gonna be able to speak after we heard the story of Beth. 
Uh, but if her situation of vulnerability had been properly represented and understood, would she still be alive? What about the child's right to health, the fundamental right linked to the right to life? Are judges ever expressing the effect that being born in prison can have on a child? What about a child's right to education? Is that ever expressed in sentencing remarks? Um, in the submissions also on the uh, proposals to change the legislation, which of course were rejected, and the government submission was, oh, you know, this isn't going wrong, judges know what they're doing. Uh, to be fair, there was some suggestion that further data would be collected. But of course, from what we've heard from Lucy, plainly judges and magistrates don't know what they're doing because women are being placed in these unsafe, stress-related environments with severe and brutal punishment for very minor offences or for non-violent, non-sexual offences. So even if there's quite a lot of money involved, these women should not be in prison at all. And there are clear, obvious alternatives that are available. Um, but what about a duty to determine sentence in accordance with the overarching principles that include these issues of child's views, overarching principles around child rights alone, duties to consider these, uh, the guidelines that we have already and fresh guidelines in relation to sentencing pregnant people, a duty to consider the rights of the child. None of this has made its way into uh, legislative provisions. And the imprisonment of a household member is one of multiple adverse childhood experiences known to have a significant impact on children's long-term health and well-being. So unfortunately, at the moment, the legislation did not make create these duties did not create a requirement for judges to give reasons, which is what was being requested, which isn't rocket science. I find it incredible that sentencing decisions are not written down um, always. Actually, all sentencing decisions should be written down and published with the reasoning included um, so that we can assess whether women's rights and child's rights are being protected. Um, but I wanted to sort of end on the uh, practice section of this lecture on the value of a person and this isn't based on any real uh, real research by me but a typical google that we always do before we're going to present a webinar let's just do a google on how do we value a person and it turns out we can we do value people there are some economic statistics as to how much a person is worth and particularly in the United States, which seems to pop up first on my computer, which is a bit odd, but there we are. Um, a person is valued economically at about $10 million at the moment. So if we're sending a, a child into prison who is going to be adversely affected by that experience, just imagine when children in the playground say, where, you, where were you born? That child is probably not going to answer if they were born in prison or has probably been lied to by their mother who feels the sort of shame that we've heard uh, when that mother was in poverty living in a car park. So just imagine those questions alone. But if we value a person at $10 million, then why are we sending anybody to prison for any offence worth less than $10 million? because the child has more value than the alleged financial crime. Now that may be drawing what we tend to call a long bow, but it seems to me that at least it allows us to put that in, in the frame. If we're going to think in economic terms that that financial crime is somehow worth more than the child who's born in prison or the mother who requires that support, then we've gone very, very wrong. Uh, that we value finance over people. And that is what really needs to change. And because it isn't changing, other than providing mother and baby units that are improving, that is not the solution. The solution is to have alternatives that don't lead to women being in prison at all and having their babies in prison and risking the lives of their babies in prison. Um, the, the answer is not to send women to prison, pregnant women to prison at all, not to send women to prison with young children and certainly not to send women to prison uh, for financial offending. 
um, the, the situation is always exceptional. We know that across the world, um, offenders, about 10% of offenders, 9 to 10% of offenders are women. So 90% of men, it's already exceptional to have a woman in the court. So judges and magistrates should be looking across the court straight away and saying, this is an exceptional sentencing exercise. What can I do that does not involve prison? It isn't rocket science. It's really straightforward. Uh, currently, it's cruel and inhumane treatment as far as uh, I'm concerned. But the important practice note is collect together all this research, it's there. And it can be very persuasive. And without a doubt, the magistrates and the judges that we're appearing in front of uh, don't know this information. If they do, they're rare, but I'm pretty confident that they don't. And certainly play them this video. All right, so that brings us to our Q&A. Um, it was a lot to take in and we probably should have given a trigger warning at the beginning. I did certainly find it incredibly moving. Uh, while you're thinking about what questions you might want to ask, and often we don't have questions because it's quite a lot to take in, so I don't mind if you haven't got any. I'm hoping someone will put their hand up. But um, just to let you know, yes, we do circulate the slides. What we do is type up an article, which is really a summary of what we've said today with some pr practice notes, with um, links to the research so that you can identify it and take it with you to court. So we publish that article in our Libertas Lens. It takes usually takes me about a month to get that sorted, maybe two. So it will come out. We always attach the slides to that so you can have the slides. Um, so there is, there's, there is follow up for this. And of course, this webinar is recorded. So you will be able to watch it again. Um, both Lucy and I speak quite quickly. So it's probably a good idea. And obviously the slides are on the recording. Um, so I don't know whether anyone's got any questions today. Uh, thank you for all the comments in the chat. I'm glad you've enjoyed it. I, I think the, the question that, oh yes, there we are, Jocelyn, thank you. Hi, Jocelyn, how are Hi. you? I'm well, thanks. Um, good thanks to so see you. Good to see you. Thanks so much for a really interesting and, as you've said, um, heartbreaking, in effect, um, presentation. Yeah. I was just wondering what the position is here in regard, for example, to community-based orders. I had a case once where my client did get a community-based order, but there was no provision for childcare. So she went off to do her, you know, whatever it was that she was supposed to be doing on a community-based order, but she left the child at home and left an electrical heater on because it was cold. Well, of course, the next door neighbour, who was somewhat of a busybody, but I suppose thought she was doing the right thing in uh, uh, taking, paying attention to the, care of the child though it would have been better if she'd actually looked after the child but she went to the police you see so then I'm representing my client who is now up on a charge of child neglect so the issue there is that child payment for child care has to be incorporated into any community-based order and it's not special treatment it's actually equalising treatment because if somebody on a community-based order has to pay for childcare, whereas somebody who doesn't have a child can go on a community-based order and doesn't have to pay for childcare, it's clearly discriminatory. But I'm just wondering whether there is A, provision for community-based orders and B, provision for childcare expenses to be paid um, in relation to the need for childcare if one's on a community-based order. Yeah, look, I, I'll just briefly give you my two penneth and then hand over to Lucy. So first of all, I think there's also a mistake in thinking that community orders have to come with a work requirement for a pregnant person or a person with a young child. Um, we all know how hard it is to be a working mother, but if you've got a woman with vulnerability, which inevitably you have in this situation, it's a punishment of itself to be able to get up out the door with the baby, get to an appointment and be supervised in some way. That is a punishment. It takes away your time, your liberty. You have to travel. You've got to get the baby ready. It's actually really hard work getting out the house with a baby. We all know that. Um, 
my view is the sort of community punishment that comes with services is a punishment of itself. It doesn't have to have that addition of work. And then, of course, work should only be added as an addition where the judge or the magistrate is satisfied that there would be childcare available. So in my view, there shouldn't be a community penalty with a work requirement if the judge can't be satisfied that there will be childcare arrangements. And we can see how that poor mother would be stuck between a rock and a hard place. I don't know the answers to whether or not there is provision. Lucy may know for childcare arrangements. I suspect not. But my view is shouldn't be a work requirement at all but if there is only if the judge or the magistrate has inquired as to whether or not there would be child care available lucy what do you think to jocelyn's question what can we know well i i mean i echo everything you've just said i agree that you know it's and i think it's the responsibility of the sentencer to ensure that if you are sentencing a community order with a work condition attached that you have considered the child care aspect that's important and one of the things that feeds into that is I really think that there needs to be we've got the sentencing guidelines and I remember having this discussion with the um the magistrates council or whatever you call them and they were like we've got sentencing guidelines we don't need anything else but I actually think we need then the specific sentencing guidelines as well and I think those kind of considerations would be set out in those gender specific sentencing guidelines as something a sentencer needs to consider um, because you're exactly right it shouldn't happen and there are other things that could have happened so it could have been a community order with a condition to attend a women's centre and a lot of the women's centres have child care provision at the women's centres while the community supervision is going on and I think we need need to invest in women's community or you know alternatives to the uh, prison for communities we know that i mean i'm sure it's the same worldwide that those investments are just not there um so we do need some really sensible alternatives to be available because one of the things that sentences do say is i had to sentence them to prison because there was nothing else but Jocelyn was really she hit the nail on the head when she said that not to offer or not to sentence um a community sentence would be discriminatory if childcare was something that was a factor. So you can't say, right, well, you can't do this type of community provision because of childcare, so I've got to send it to prison. So we have to be careful of not falling into that gap. And there's a there's a there's a responsibility that's broader than the legal system, than the, broader than the criminal justice system to make sure those good alternatives to prison are available. Yeah. It's a yeah. difficult situation. Mm. Absolutely. Um, mm. Look, I, the other thing, the practice note that I think is really important is I, I have the luxury, of course, of being in silk to make written submissions on a regular basis. But I've done it for a very long time. I was sort of reasonably well known as a junior as producing what people used to laugh at and call too much paperwork. Oh, Miss Gary rocking up again with a plethora of paperwork. And I didn't take that as a criticism. And often if you can write a short submission on sentence before sentencing for every case that you're in, I know that's a burden and I know we're all busy. It's at those points that you can provide information to courts that, that they assume they know and they don't. Um, there's a lot of assumptions about, well, we've got sentencing guidelines, so we know what we're doing, but it doesn't include the sorts of things and that we're I, talking about. I think about. it is really important that the courts and that legal representatives in courts know what's available in that local yeah. area and can have a discussion with probation or the equivalent. Because when I was a probation officer, one of the things that we used to do was we'd be really creative with alternatives to prison. Uh, if we had somebody who, for, for whom English wasn't the first language, we would approach the local um, community hub for that culture or that ethnicity and say, would you take this person on a community work order? So it may be that, you know, it's about exploring creative alternatives to prison as well. And again, that takes time, but if legal representatives make those relationships with probation and know the provisions in the local area, it's much easier to go to court prepared to say, well, she can't do this, but she could do this. There you go. So the, a little lesson for all of us to be more informed ourselves, to produce that information to the court, 
pick up the phone, do make what inquiries we can, but also to produce the research. I think that's most important. It's been it, it's been sitting there for decades, if not longer. And, and somebody take are... on, somebody take up the mantle. So listen, maybe this is something you and me should do. Take up the mantle to produce some gender specific sentencing guidelines because I there we are. That, yes, let's do I, that. Let's I, do I, that. That I, sounds I, great. And I think that's a great way to end this webinar. I always like being given something more to do. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, ask busy women uh, and we'll get it done. So I think that's a good outcome from this webinar. I think we've gone a little bit over time. Sorry. So I will wrap it up now. Don't apologise. It's been absolutely fantastic. Um, very emotional experience, I'm sure, for all of us. Um, brilliant that you could all attend on a Thursday evening. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. We will follow up with our article. And Lucy, I'll speak to you separately about some gender specific sentencing guidelines <laughs> and Perfect, how really. to get the research under the noses of the magistrates and just judges. Um, thank you all for your time, everyone. Good to see you. Um, thank you I for should coming. advertise before we go, I'm I should advertise our next webinar which, if my diary is right, is the uh, 28th of April with Dr. Gina Vale on women in terrorism. So another topic relating to women, but this time terrorism. So we've done high value and low value financial crime today, terrorism next time, really serious issues relating to women. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Lucy. Um, see you Thank soon. You. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. -bye.